right. Well, I'm going to call this meeting of the Addison Center School District to order uh, today, March 28th. Um, and first off, when we do introductions, we can start down at the end of the table here. Well, Hatch Technology Director. Jen is here. Peter Rose, Superintendent. Victoria Jetty. Mary Gill. Jamie McCallum. Barbara Wilson. Joanna Dorian. Brian Bauer, Middle Mary Heather Noble. Jane Suzanne Buck. Peter Conlon. Steve Orzak. <coughs> Caitlin Steele, Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning. Nicole Carter, Director of Equity and Student Services. Logan Price, Business Manager. Uh, Laura Hartman, uh, Parent. <laughs> Karen Duguay. Great, thank you, welcome everyone. Um, as we do at each meeting, now is the moment for public comment. Um, we will look to the public in the room first. If you have a comment, please raise your hand, and then we'll look at our attendees on Zoom. Any public comment in the room? And on Zoom, any public comment, please raise your Zoom hand. All right. Uh, moving on, a recommendation to approve the minutes of March 14th. I'll move we approve the minutes of March 14th. Second. Seconded by Chip. Any questions, comments? I had one. Oh. Um, so the, the paragraph that's in section B1 and it's paragraph 7, um, there's a lot of, there's some questions around a potential conflict of interest and um, I was noticing it's sort of out of context, it's not when that was brought up and it's not attributed to anybody. What is reflected accurately is later on in section, I think it's the superintendent report and it's paragraph five, it is reflected. So this idea that it was talked about twice is an emphasis that's probably not very accurate. And um, I, I would like to have that paragraph in the yeah, yeah, just just to clarify, I, I agree with that. I think that is a little artifact of uh, minutes being begun <laughs> by one person and then continued by myself. So. Um, I, I would agree that we should probably remove the, the first reference and just keep it in, um, in line of when it happened, kind of along the discussion. So that would be my recommendation. We need to Great. Mix that. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I was just going to make a statement that you don't see consent agenda on here. <laughs> <laughs> I take it. Uh, feedback like, was yeah, feedback really noted. <laughs> <laughs> but even though it doesn't say consent agenda, <laughs> this is something you do every year. Um, okay, so with the one correction, um, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Hi, Lindsay. Hi. Welcome. Hi, yes. Oh, excellent. Um, and Chip. <coughs> uh, reviewing the bills is much just a comment before I do it. They've, they've changed the uh, way the accounts payable will be. Uh, I don't know. The will review. And rather than having the health, dental, and uh, other benefits in the payroll, it will end up in the accounts payable. So for this month, the accounts payable is substantially bigger. Uh, it's one million three hundred and fifty-five thousand five hundred and fifty-four dollars and forty-two cents. I just thought to uh, to clarify that, oh, and I did this very grossly when I looked at it. About fifteen. About 115,000 is for student transportation. That doesn't come up every every time. Uh, about 107,000, almost 108,000 is for the preschool quarterly payments that we pay to the different vendors or different 
schools across the county or whatever. And uh, about 406,000 was for the VA, VEHI health and 40,000 for the dental. So that's what makes up, as Barb reviewed them today, I just wanted to make sure we were clear on that. That number is substantially higher. We'll probably remain higher when we look at it. It's just that it's we're reporting in that particular one. So, like I, I, I said that one. Then there's two payroll numbers, one for uh, $3,460.54 and one for $923,535.50. Uh, move that we uh, pay the bills. Okay. okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Peter. Oh, parliamentary thing. Yes, please. Uh, so we started raising our hand floating back in our Zoom days. We don't have to. Read it that I would just say that it, it, it gets a little confusing as to which one is the actual vote, the voice or the hands. Yep. Um, and I would suggest that we just return to voice votes. Voice votes. Got it. So unless, for, if, you're, for if you're on Zoom, you raise your Zoom hand and vote. Otherwise, a voice vote is fine. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <coughs> report of the superintendent. Great. Thank you. Take it away. I've got a few things to just that aren't on the agenda that I'm going to report. But before I do that, since Karen Duguay is here as our representative, I would like to move to discussion of the Parks and Rec representative update to hear from Karen. Is it okay if I sit here? Yeah, not reserved for <laughs> Okay. Thanks, guys. It's nice to see people's faces in person. I haven't seen most of you in a really long time, so happy to be here with you. Um, the other thing we haven't done in a long time is meet as a Parks and Rec committee. So uh, it's been uh, quite some time. Our last one was over Zoom. Uh, we do have one scheduled for April 13th. But I went in and met with Dustin and Scott to get an update as to where things currently stand and the things that we're going to be talking about at our next meeting. Um, so, if you remember, this fall was the first time under the new structure um, with sixth grade playing soccer through MUMS instead of through Parks and Rec. So I have some news to kind of report out about that. Um, it was the only one that kind of stayed. So the sixth graders played Rec basketball with the 5-6 Rec. They're going to be playing Little League for softball and baseball and club lacrosse. And then at middle school is um, seven through, or six, seven, and eight were all cross country and track and field. So those were not a rec program already. So soccer is really the only one that was sort of removed from the Parks and Rec program and brought over to MUMS. Um, I would say that the feedback was not great um, for a few reasons. On the Parks and Rec side, the fifth grade only teams played predominantly five, six uh, teams. And uh, coaches reported back that kids were just feeling really demoralized and defeated. And that's a really hard age to feel that way. You really want them sticking with it and um, getting, getting some positive experiences so that they go on to keep playing. Um, and then on the sixth grade side, we did hear from parents that there weren't a lot of games because there's not a lot of schools that really had a sixth grade. The games that they did play were often against older kids, and so they kind of had a similar experience that the fifth graders did. So what Parks and Rec is going to do is make the five-six soccer available again, as six you know sixth graders basically have the option. Uh, they can choose to play for months. They can choose to play on the rec team, or they can choose both. Um, and they will purposely schedule practices to not overlap. So it seems like a good compromise. Hopefully we'll get those athletes some time on the field in one way or another and, um, and that it makes everybody a little bit happier. Um, in soccer, we had 206 players preschool through fifth. That was down some from average years, even without counting the sixth grade. A couple of reasons for that, probably COVID um, related in some instances. We had 126 basketball players, K to six. And uh, there were year-round classes for gymnastics, which averaged seven kids a class. Um, so strong programming still um, for the, for the school-age stuff. Uh, the Parks and Rec hosted the Middlebury Basketball Tournament this year after not having it last year. Didn't offer refreshments, had to stay masked. Um, and we followed all of the 
ACSD protocols when it came to COVID um, re requirements and restrictions. Um, and uh, Middlebury had two, Middlebury, ACSD had two um, boys and two girls teams, and they actually both took first and second, which is really great. Huge accomplishment for those kids. Um, Dustin is looking into possibly being offer being able to offer swimming lessons through the school. Um, and he's looking at working with the PE teachers on how to coordinate this. There would be a small cost associated to pay for instruction. Um, so that's something just to kind of put on your radar that you may see as a request come through, um, depending on, on the interest of the schools. Uh, but that's something that you know would happen probably end of May, early June. I'm not sure that they're thinking this year because of that coordination that needs to happen in the budgeting and all of that, but um, it's been something that's on the radar for them for a while that they've wanted to be able to offer. So that might be a nice thing to be able to offer our schools. Uh, transportation continues to be a challenge for students from Shoreham and Bridport, particularly for the after-school practices. They're cognizant of that. They really try to make scheduling those after-school sports a little bit later to allow for parents to get out of work and be able to transport kids in. Uh, it's not always possible, especially with the gym time being so in demand in the winter. Uh, so they do the best that they can there, but that continues to be an issue. Uh, and then finally, we are exploring partnering with other stakeholders in Middlebury on what's called the Better Places Grant. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. The state of Vermont is offering Better Places grants to different communities um, and their placemaking grants. So essentially the idea is uh, funding to create places that people want to be. Uh, they want it to be fairly close to the downtown, but our bike ped folks in town are thinking about things like a pump track and maybe some outdoor recreation enhancements and they're really looking at mums as a possible location so very early stages in all of this you will be kept in the loop if it actually progresses past these idea stages but for now that is something that a group of folks are looking at that's it for me any questions yes uh, the swim program for the uh, all the schools does it mean every grade i mean what grades will actually participate in don't know i think dustin has an idea i'm guessing it's probably gonna well i think he's want he really wants to talk to the, the phys ed teachers first so okay. i think phys ed teachers are going to be the first communication gauge the interest from there and then he's going to go up the chain and just see like is this something that the schools even are looking to be able to do and, and what where do they think the focus should be in terms of age okay and would it be the entire class i hope so yeah okay. I, think, I don't think yeah they wouldn't want to just only certain kids they okay want to do right. it as a group because mary hogan's do they, they have a swim program or they always they did I mean, I yeah yeah well they in the summer yeah no, no for they, they gym class. The oh not yeah you know it's been so long it's since my kids <laughs> it's, no, not no, it's, it's just through mary hogan yeah, yeah they went to the college first. but they haven't yeah. done it in no, so long months, they were months, months. Months. they haven't been there the last two years oh of i since i've had kids there they have it was well, the first and second grade okay my kids all do yeah yeah but i know one of my kids went to the middlebury college but that was the last time and that was that was the first year they did it there, and then really? they moved to Vermont Sun. Okay, interesting. Gosh, time is flying, especially when you lose <laughs> two, two years. <laughs> Barb? Yeah, um, so um, transportation, you um, mentioned, was an issue of Shoreham and Bridport. Why isn't it an issue for some of the other outlying towns, like Salisbury? And I think those are the parents that he's heard from. So he hasn't heard from parents from Salisbury and some of these other schools. The transportation is, big of an, is as big of an issue. So, but he does repeatedly hear from parents in those two communities. Yeah. Um, the last piece you were talking about with the with the grant, mm -hmm. the middle school, you're connecting with the community partnership council folks and some of the Middlebury. I know there's. I've been hearing about these initiatives through these other two groups. So I'm making sure it's all the same thing, and we're not working. In yes, it is all the same thing. Yeah. 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 Yep. And actually, <laughs> that is a, that's a real Right, I'm like, how many times are we going to apply to the same place? Yeah, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Middlebury as a municipality can only apply, okay. our community can only apply for one, okay. one instance. And so that's coordinating the land. I know that that was part of the question. Yes. Can we use this land? Yes. Okay, great. That's exactly. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for being our representative to the rec board. It's, it's really nice to know you, you're taking care of things. Um, any work planned on the sort of rec um, park property 
in the next year? Well, they had just completely redone that top lot yeah. um, and planted all of those trees. Right. Um, I know when, when the initial conversations about better places started, we were talking about a pump track in that area. And then, you know, we were like, well, we just planted the trees where we would have put the pump track. <laughs> um, but, you know, I don't believe that there's anything else planned. I know that they've got some improvements planned for the pool. Um, there's a climbing wall that's going to be going up in the pool, which is really cool. So um, they've got some things in the works there, but I don't know that there's anything planned for the fields. Yeah. Um, but I can put that on to ask um, at our meeting. Thanks. Was there something with the pool? I don't. You might not know this, but I, I thought the pool had to be rebuilt. Or I don't know. Uh -huh. um, at one point, I do believe it was drained, but. Yeah, yeah. I think it's all set. But again, we'll. I I expect those details we'll hear a lot more about. But those are the kinds of things that when you when you're not meeting, you're not necessarily. That's a thirty year problem, by the way. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's the There's always a culture. Yeah, anyway, so. yeah. <laughs> the heater doesn't work. There's a crack. If anybody has any other questions that you want me to specifically take back to the committee, feel free to email me um, or reach out in any other way. Thank you, Karen. Awesome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention, uh, you, you may have seen that communication about the Ukraine that we sent out mm -hmm. last week. So there's been just awesome work happening across the district in pretty much all of our schools on varying fronts. Um, the vigil uh, that SCORE is organizing is happening tomorrow night. Um, there's all sorts of work happening in classrooms and, and throughout the district. It's great to see this kind of involvement. And um, I think it's kind of what we need right now, too, as we kind of find ourselves on our computers and on our screens, seeing all these things happening and not feeling like we can do anything about it. So that's something that we're talking about a lot. Um, in all of our schools that finding ways for students to engage right now is really, really important and engaging in positive ways, ways that can, can make change. Um, so that, that is awesome and I um, hope to see folks there tomorrow if you can make it at 6.30. Uh, the other thing before we talk about ESSER context and planning, uh, which is a somewhat long presentation, I just wanted to give a quick update on the strategic plan for equity. We are finalizing a timeline. I have made copies to, to give to you tonight and then realized there, there were a few more things to add. So we're gonna finalize this probably in the next two days and I will send all of you a copy. Um, we have been working with the advisory committee with Emma, who is our consultant who's working with that advisory committee. Um, that advisory committee right now is, is gathering further data, um, figuring out ways to, to get more data um, beyond what we've already gathered through the um, equity audit, that survey tool, um, handover research, the, the consultant that we're working with on all the, the data and back-end work, our, um, the, the privacy agreement which we were waiting for, how long was that, Caitlin? Months. Months. Finally went through last week. So uh, we got the green light, everything is go for them to take all of the data that we sent them, and this is all sorts of disparate data and from all sorts of different sources in ACSD. That has been sent to them. We're going to get that back with the dashboard to be able to really start to comb through and look at, you know, we talk a lot anecdotally about, well, we feel like things are this way or that way, so to really be able to see where where are we making it, where are we not, and how does that inform the work that the board does over the summer in establishing those foundational goals as you get the handoff from the advisory committee. We're looking at probably towards the end of August. Um, in looking at the work that the advisory committee is doing to finish up the next probably three months in, in, in finding connections across the community to get data from people that don't normally take a survey, don't, you know, the, the um, underrepresented folks that we need to hear from as we go through this process. Um, so I will, I will be sharing that with all of you. It'll, I think, help to to better understand the process when you get this timeline. Um, this is a, you know, not nitty gritty in terms of exact dates, but um, we kind of couched it in spring, summer, fall, and then to what we think is will be the conclusion towards the end of December. 
You go first. Okay. Um, in trying to reach the families or the people who don't necessarily uh, fill out surveys, is there any way to contact them personally and interview them or have a student or somebody or a representative? So the advisory that? committee is, is right now talking. That's, okay. That is what they're talking about right now. Um, for example, there was a, a parent who brought together Spanish speaking families right. I think last night and our gathering information from them. So we're, we're doing this really differently than we normally okay. do in terms of, okay, we're going to do these three things, you know, lots of communication and then hope that all those, you know, seeds plant. Instead, yeah. we're, we're kind of like going, like you said, yeah. going into homes and doing those kinds of things to really make sure that we're right. reaching those people. Right. Oh, great. Um, <clears throat> The other day, as I was pruning, I was listening to a podcast from the School Board Association, and they recently had an equity training, which I am disappointed I didn't sign up for because I was listening to it. And it yeah. was pretty awesome. Was this via the SBA? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so it occurred to me as I was listening to this, like our advisory committee, and I mean even all of us, have we helped you know provided them any kind of bias training? That kind of thing, you know, to, you know, because you can't have too much of that yeah. from my experience. I and think Emma's doing a really, really um, kind of thoughtful work in not doing bias training right. with this group because we don't have time to right. bring this group together, do a lot of bias training. But she's really leading through with that lens in terms of. Uh, what the group talks about, um, how she facilitates the meetings. Uh, Nicole is president of those meetings too. Nicole, do you want to speak to that? As our director of equity and student services. About bias training? With the advisory committee? Yeah. Just how, how they're how doing, going. doing the work with that yeah. lens. I would, I would say right now we ju we're just entering digging into the work of looking at what's happening across the district um, looking at data sets, looking, talking about what we're seeing with patterns. Mm -hmm. We spent the first bulk of our work just trying to figure out what do we mean by equity um, and really spending a lot of time listening to the voices of the students who are in the group, um, mm -hmm. parents who don't work for the district. Mm -hmm. um, and Emma's doing an amazing job of weaving all our voices together. Um, we have not looked at bias training right now. Right, right. We don't really need bias. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Point we need bias, bias awareness. Awareness. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I kind of left out a word there. <laughs> Thank you. I totally understood what you meant. Yeah. I didn't know if you said it or I said it. So well, I did. <laughs> well, that you know, Mark, some of what comes out of this process, I, I think, will as we look at what what they distill from all this data they're collecting and what the board looks at will then, you know, as we build those action teams in the fall and figure out where are we are spending all of our time as a district, you know, is it in more kind of anti-racist, you know, bias awareness training, or is it, you know, and in addition, it's probably going to be that, but it's going to also be layered on with, like, as we do the work, like, equity doesn't exist over here. So, you know, we're doing equity work here, we're getting trained here, but then we're just continuing to do the work we do in the same way we always do it, with the same blind spots and blinders, etc. So that's the challenge of this work is in many organizations which are calcified and siloed and you know everyone who works in an organization experiences this at some level. How do we how do we bring equity into this conversation right now? As opposed to I've been trained and therefore I, I work in an equity-grounded way. You know, it's about personal transformation too, both yeah, of the totally. individual and of the totally. all of the, us, everyone, all of yeah. us. Yeah, yeah. exactly. All of us. Yeah. Right. Um, Peter, can you talk a little bit about the when the data are being delivered to the board? What what that will look like? Uh, I mean, I sort of presume there will be some kind of. Uh, Synthesis that's happened, patterns identified, things like that, or or is the board going to be part of that review of raw stuff and, and kind of working with the advisory committee? Can you just so talk the about that? the advisory committee, I think, is still and Emma is still like 
try to figure out what that final distilled, when they talk about distilled data, um, at, what does that mean to be distilled? Like how refined is it? So looking at patterns and, and locating those patterns and then showing this is a pattern that was found 25 times or that kind of thing. So that, that is something that the advisory committee has to talk about. What they have discussed thus far is, is working on recommendations based on that data um, I, I don't I think it's fine you know for the board to see any of the data um, but the work of that advisory committee is to again to bring voices to the work representative voices to the work so that when the board gets this it's not just in this room and from this governance kind of perspective but really getting the voices from the entire community so their their you know their their goal is kind of twofold one to be out in the community connecting and bringing that information in and then figuring out how to put it together to, to present in terms of recommendations. And I, I presume the timeline that we'll get uh, in the next few days, mm -hmm. is that sort of lay out where we might be involved, where we're going to get, yep. um, because I know this whole group, we all feel how important this work is. Um, and it's. We can be patient, but I think it's hard. <laughs> it's, no. hard it, it, it's hard being, being patient, and so it would be great to hear sort of the expectations around how we can be helpful, as well as when, when yeah. right. that might be. <laughs> Anyone else? I don't know the other things. I wanted to go on the survey, and I couldn't do it because I wasn't a, a student. I wasn't a parent and I wasn't on the faculty. So right. when will the regular community be able to do that, the survey? Or is it too late? Yeah, I think they've already collected it, right? Yeah, it's closed. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. couldn't do it either. Yeah. Okay. Well, you couldn't. No, I couldn't no, get on. I, I tried. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't either. I could. I could. I tried to because I was a parent. Yeah. You're a parent. Yeah. Oh, you're so, parent. I guess I could have lied, yeah. Well. Parent. <laughs> <laughs> You could have skewed the data. Nobody could say, oh, I did what I have? Actually, no. Probably it's kind of a stretch. They didn't ask that question. Yeah, they did. That's, that's uh, something that could be noted and delivered to the advisory committee. Yeah. yeah. There's a whole swath of folks who would want to participate. Right. Well, we were just broken up into groups looking at, I think, a mini group talking about staff and looking at the survey data and trying to figure out what else we need. So if there's a group that is community-based, I need to look at that. A lot of it, even for those of us who could take it, a lot of the questions were unanswerable. Mm -hmm. Not having been in the schools for a while, right. you know, questions yeah. like... That's why I don't remember. How many I did get on it, and that was my impression. Yeah, has yeah. your child, you know, worked in a group with kids different from them? Mm -hmm. well, I, no, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, There's a 39-page white paper, apparently, on the survey. On the survey. Yeah. Well, I know, I remember you saying that this was a national survey. This is yeah. not a survey that the, that the steering committee right. came up right. with, right? This is we, did add, we did add some questions to the survey, yep. so the advisory committee felt like, as they reviewed it, they, we asked, could we add some? And, you know, given the kind of survey validity, Initially, they had said, "Well, you know, it's, if you want this to be valid, you should not change every question." And, right. I like this word, not that word. Right. Kind of thing. It must be a standard. Uh, but they did add, but they did add some questions at the end, and some of that, which might be a nice segue, um, some of the some of those questions were related to ESSER and the information that we needed to gather. Uh, from the community as we look at investments. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we are going to present tonight on ESSER context and planning. We've been doing a ton of work. Um, Caitlin has been doing a ton of work. Logan is doing a ton of work. Uh, we've all been doing a lot of work to figure out with our, our ESSER funds how we're moving forward. So there was a, a conversation about this I think it was last, was it last Tuesday or? Caitlin, Tuesday, the conversation? Yep. Yep. There was a meeting on Tuesday. We sent information out that you all maybe saw 
three weeks ago. Uh, and you know, we're, as we look at, at where we're spending these funds, we're really kind of trying to figure out, looking at our data and figuring out where the most need is. Um, we are, as we look at where these investments are going, and I think as we reached out to our community, it was pretty clear that people wanted to invest in positions as opposed to some of the other things that were on the list. We had um, some HVAC work at Mary Hogan. Um, we had some windows and doors, security cameras, and things like that. We also had uh, counseling positions and um, other support services throughout our school. So we are, and, and Caitlin and Nicole are going to be doing this presentation together, we're going to be working really pointedly to look at, at where the most need is and funneling these dollars towards those schools and those classrooms and those students that, um, based on the information that we have, need the most support. We are also really, really cognizant of the fact that this is a two-year flush of funds that just goes away. And if we don't set ourselves up for having some kind of solid system in place when these monies dry up, we're going to be in a real challenging place. And in my experience, when you add positions into a budget, it's really hard to say goodbye to those positions. And, and oftentimes there's a great argument for every position that we have. Um, so we are we are trying to do this in a context where we we put the the money where the need is greatest, while also realizing that we need to be prepared for 24 when we don't have these funds anymore, when the state surplus is gone and they can't throw 45 million here and 45 million there, um, and the waiting study which is still in process. Um, Ruth Hardy, who was the co-chair on that task force, will be coming in May to talk to the board and present. I was just um, talking to her today, so I think it's going to be the second meeting in May. She'll be coming to do a quick presentation and answer questions on that. Um, so there's a lot there's a lot to think about here. I think this, this presentation will be helpful to give the board a, a sense of kind of where we are and how we're taking community feedback to funnel these funds in the directions that um, they're most needed. So what was this um, kind of the scope of the community feedback? What was the, the universe that was... We'll go, we'll yeah, go deep. Deep. Okay, we're going to Okay, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm not going to steal any more thunder. <laughs> you're not stealing thunder, you're saying thunder. Okay, I'm trying to. I'm, 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 I'm trying to. I hope to. it's okay if I stand. I'm doing better for them when I move my body. So, Hi everybody. Hi. <laughs> I think Peter said um, Tuesday was when the Esther conversations were happening and we realized um, someplace between Tuesday and Thursday that it would actually probably be helpful to also give you information about student services to set the context even more deeply. Um, so I don't think this is in your board pack, so we will get it to you. Um, and I'm going to go as slow fast as needed, okay? Well, yeah, and I also want to say this this presentation is very text heavy, especially when we get to the ESSER stuff that I've produced. So we'll run through it relatively quickly, but then make sure that you have access to it for yep. reference so you can look back at the details. Okay. So my clicker's not working. Turn it on. Turn it on. <laughs> the right we'll clicker, right? Yeah. We can do it the old-fashioned way. It just means I won't be as seamless as I'd like to be. The purpose! Oh, so here's the purpose of this slideshow. I believe there's four points. Point one. Oh, point one. This information will continue to inform our ESSER grant spending. Purpose two. we got to get a functioning clicker. I know. I've got another one in my bag. I've got another one. Per uh, <laughs> point two is... It's also important to think about this when you're seeing this information, to we anticipate the state is moving forward with two really significant changes for schools. Special ed rules change will change on July 1st and Act 173, which shifts funding for special education. The third purpose 
for this slideshow. <laughs> yes. Danny is, wait for it, we want to give you time to think about the current student service data because in April, Caitlin and I are going to prepare, we're going to present to you about um, MTSS, about multi-tiered systems of service. And then the fourth reason, wait for it, <laughs> yes, um, we think it'll also help, we know some of you, maybe all of you, I don't actually know, are going to be touring schools, so I thought it might be helpful to have this information in your heads and hearts as you enter through school front doors. Okay, moving on. So here's the background. This is probably the most important slide. Ready? One, this data is current as of March 25th. Was that Friday? I don't even remember. It's just that moment in time. It will change. It's not two years ago. It's not a year ago. It's not six months ago. It's March 25th. And it'll be different by May 1st. Number two, it's collected through multiple data streams and it is as accurate as those streams were on March 25th. Caitlin and I have a lot of work to do in terms of helping us become more data cohesive. So this is, this is me pulling from many places. Number three, this data is descriptive. That just means it's a summary of data. It is not a statistical analysis to uncover relationships between data sets. There's no statistics happening. Okay? And fourth, you're going to want to make a story of it. I'm dying to make a story of it. Resist the urge. Let it, let it help inspire curiosity. What's that great quote about the questions? Live the questions. This is a live the questions presentation because your mind is, you'll see, when we get to the first one, you're going to go, oh, that's what's happening. Oh, resist it. <laughs> Write down questions if you need to that you can carry with you. Okay. <laughs> so here's some glossary of terms because not you know schools are full of full of jargon. Here we go. IEP is an individual education plan. There are 13 federal disability categories for IEPs, and an IEP covers both modifications and accommodations to the school's curriculum to ensure access the general education curriculum is often referred to as specialized instruction. So when I talk about IEPs, I'm talking about plans that ensure access to the general education curriculum. 504 plans are different. They are part of civil, a civil right to environmental accommodations to ensure access. To have a 504 plan requires that there's a subs you're, you have a disability that, that has a substantial impact on a major life activity. A major life activity is learning. I'm going to keep going. EST, Educational Support Team, known as an EST plan. This is a Vermont thing, right? So federal, federal, Vermont. A team comes together to collaboratively to determine whether additional supports are needed to help a student make progress in school. These plans are produced by these teams and are referred to as EST plans. Keep going? Okay. MTSS, the newest and the latest term. Oh. Uh oh, now you know what it looks like. <laughs> MTSS, it stands for a multi tiered system of services for three tiers of instructional practices, not students. That's a really important thing to hear me. I'm going to say it again. It's tiered instructional practices not tiered students. It's about what we do. Um, so tiers one, two, and three, you'll see on the next slide, this is a public health model. It started in hospitals. Um, and it pretty much looks like this. You've got tier three, and those tier three practices in our context are <coughs> IEPs, and they're the most intensive. When people talk about tiered supports, the like, long-term goal is that only 5% of a student population needs really intensive support because down here they're getting such rich instruction. Tier 2, in our context, is 504 and EST plans. And 504 and EST plans target supports for the general education environment. It's not specialized instruction. And it's 
generally thought that 10 to 15 percent of the student population can access the general curriculum with tier two practices. And then finally, the largest tier, 80 percent of the student population, their learning needs are met by tier one practices. And this is the model that the state is moving towards. They don't, when you look it up, they don't show you a triangle. They have a swirling circle. They mean the same thing. I just think that conceptually, where we are in understanding this, this is a little bit easier to understand than the swirl. But at some point, I'm happy to come back and talk about the swirl. OK. Let's see what's next. Can I ask you a quick question on that? Yeah. Uh, currently, what do we have that would be considered tier three? If the goal is 5%, where, where are we? I'm about to take you on that journey. Okay. So here we are, Tier 2 and Tier 3 practices right now on March 25th. So here's our enrollment as of March 25th. I don't imagine anything here will surprise you. The bars that have black around them are Title I schools. Right? So Title I schools get supplemental funds because of the highest student concentrations of poverty. Okay. So here's tier three practices, the percentage of students who are supported by IEP plans by school. Yeah. Looking at MOMS and MUHS, they don't they don't qualify for the tier one at all, or is it only elementary school? For Title One, the only Title One schools right now are Bridgeport, Mary Hogan, Salisbury, and Shoreham. So the all the students who fall into the middle school and the high school, the poverty level never reaches the same. Okay. The FRL data is um, given back to us by the, it's reported from us to the state. They process it, report it back to us every year. And these numbers change every year. So schools that qualify and do not qualify change from year to year. Um, in the time that I've been here, MUMS and MUHS have never had a high enough poverty rate to qualify for Title I funds. Really? Okay, I'm going to keep going. Okay, so that's Tier 3 practices on March 25th. So here's 504 plans, which is one part of Tier 2 practices. Resist the urge to create a story in your head. <laughs> we really don't have a story yet. What we have is an awareness of what's happening right now. Okay, and let's go on to the second part of Tier 2 practices, which are EST plans. So, Will, if you can do slide 8, 9, and 10 again. If I'm counting correctly, slide B is tier. So just give everybody another moment to. Tier three practices, the most intensive. Okay. Part of tier two practices, 504 plans, accommodations. And then the next one. And then BST plans. Tell me again what BST is. Yeah. Can you go back before you do this one? BST is educational support team. Do those overlap uh, if you're on the EST or you also want to yes. pass on IEP in a 504? You can have all three. You could have two. You could have one. Or none. You could definitely have none. <laughs> okay. Could, could I ask a clarifying question? Of course. <clears throat> in your model, I'm not interpreting any of the data yet, um, what you said was that uh, at tier three, ideally in the model, you want 5% of the people at tier three. And 10 to 15 percent right. tier two, mm -hmm. um, and tier two is a combination of the last three slides that we saw. Tier two is a combination of the last two. Last the five before the ESD. Yeah, and and since you're asking that question, Caitlin's got a lot to cover. I'll talk more about MTSS when we come back. My, my, clar my clarifying question is, is there any way to see the combination of what are the total number of people that are in Tier 2 intervention? So, what I can show you is this. Okay. <clears throat> because our data system doesn't support right now, in a quick manner for me to tell you, 
how many kids have only one plan or two plans or three plans, that's going to take a while for me to... We need to build that need, system. Yeah, for, for me to figure out. But this is for right now, right? So there could be a kid who's in all, who's getting practices in all three. Okay. So we, if, can't, we can't just add 504 and EST no, and get that to you? we can't. And if we think about it in terms of practices and not kids, it actually helps to read it a little bit differently, right? So we've got personnel in our schools. Let's look at MUHS just because it's right close to my hand. We've got personnel in our schools, right, where they're providing 8% are EST, are EST practices, 504 practices, and special education practices. Yeah. I'm just wondering about the EST, how the EST practices overlap with the 504 practices, simply because they're in the same tier, and the 504, you said, is, is a national, mm -hmm. and the EST is more of a Vermont thing. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it just kind of like what we're calling it, maybe? Are there some overlapping techniques that are happening, but maybe one school's labeling it as a 504 and another is more of an EST? Um, it's likely not the last thing you said. So a 504 plan means that you've met, you that you have shown evidence of a disability, mm -hmm. and so we accommodate the environment for that. We could be accommodating it similarly, but an EST is a little bit more about, um, so you can think of a 504 sometimes as like taking an obstacle away, and an EST can be more about pushing in targeted support with literacy. So taking away note taking versus learning phonetics in a new way. Those are two that don't overlap. Okay. Can they overlap? Hmm. Possibly. Yeah. With the EST, is, does that, in order to get support services from that, do you need to have been, you know, some kind of testing done, um, medical, Nothing medical okay. or EST, but definitely assessment data. Okay. And we'll be looking closely at that at our next presentation. Okay. About how these tiers interact with each other. Thanks. <coughs> so is the EST something like a kid that needs a little extra help with reading and gets pulled out for like a small group saying for a little bit? Or is it more than that? An EST is a practice. It's Think of it as like you get your first dose of instruction, right? That first time everybody learns how to like... Um, CVC words, consonant, vowel, consonant, and then um, we provide practices where you double dose CVC words, where you learn it two or three times more, maybe in a new way, so that it really, so that you really get it. I'm trying to avoid saying it's about kids because it's really about practices. I'm talking about the practice of like, like what actually happens management. in school where a kid might go and get that extra instruction, that the act of that instruction, I'm not talking about the kid, I'm talking about the instruction, is that is that an example of an ESD practice that would count in your it, it could be, yes, if it's if it's provided by an interventionist or a classroom teacher. Okay. So it's important you don't have to leave the classroom. You can leave the classroom, but you don't have to. Does that help? Yes, I think that's just a matter of semantics, but yes. Yeah, uh, I guess I'm kind of I'm very concerned about the 504, the number of 504s in the high school. I mean, they're significantly high, more than double what's in the middle school. So, is it? I mean, they have to have a diagnosis, correct, to get a 504? Yep. So, is this uh, primarily? I mean, I know there's physical disabilities, but are we looking at mental? Disabilities here, or with behavioral disabilities? I, if if I if I answered that question, I would be guessing. Okay. Because I haven't broken down the data by okay. disability category. Okay. But just to just to kind of shed a little light on that, I mean, I think what happens often, and you know, just speaking as a parent or right. as a child on a plan who's who's been a part of the, yeah. these percentages, um, oftentimes. Uh, the difficulty is what prompts, you know, so yeah, yeah. as curriculum gets more challenging, that's right. what prompts an evaluation. Right. Oh, so right. Um, right. It, it wouldn't be uncommon, I don't think it would be uncommon for, you know, as as it increases in difficulty. But it's identified later because of the rigor of the 
The important thing to say is, huh, yeah. <laughs> let's yeah. find out more about that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if there's another slide. I can't remember. I'm going to hand over to Caitlin. Yeah, I have a matching slide at the end of mine, so if you have more questions, we should wait. Are you saying your general way of saying more questions? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on to them. All right, this should look familiar because you've seen a version of this slideshow before, and this is a bit of an abrupt transition, right? So we've got this big pot of money that we want to spend. You know that our theme for this year is access, success, and belonging. We really care about that. And that context of, of identified needs in our system is informing our work, um, but in a nonlinear way at this point. So we wanted to give you an update on our ESSER thinking. You've seen this, this bit here where we're just reviewing. You've seen this before, what ESSER stands for. You've seen the allowable uses. When I came in, when I presented in December, we looked at these slides. So this is it's very broad what we can spend our ESSER funds on. You've seen what we can do with the ARP IDEA. That's the um, from the same act as ARP ESSER. This is the special education component of it. So that's not new information. And you've seen this table before, right? So we have in this. ESSER family of grants, about $5.3 million, about $5.4 million to spend between now and September of 2024. That's when the last of them dry up for us. Um, you can see the smallest, well, I guess the smallest is the IDEA, but ESSER 1, ESSER 2, and this big ARP ESSER. You can see that we've done our initial applications for the first three, though they're all amendment, the amendment window is open still for all three of those. The first one, um, our final amendments for ESSER 1 are due May 1st, and we have to spend them down by the end of September. And then they're basically about a year later for ESSER 2, and then another year later for our ESSER. So this is just context about where this money goes. You've seen this before. So we had four, $403,000 in change for ESSER 1. This is what we did with it. I uh, recently reconciled this grant. We have about $36,000 still on the table. I think if you click, it'll show us that. Yep. So about, uh, about $36,000 based on basically a position that we hired later in the year than we wanted to, so we didn't end up paying for the full 1.0 FTE. So we've got some and, uh, other little things like that in terms of how much did these investments actually cost us. So this is still on the table to be reallocated by May 1st. Um, go ahead. This is what we've done with ESSER 2, and you've seen this slide before. Um, and you can see that some of them are our SEL coordinator, which we had funded partially in ESSER 1. We extended it, we finished funding it for this year in ESSER 2, and we continued it for next year in ESSER 2. So that's already covered. Same thing with our literacy coordinator. It's funded for next year in ESSER 2. So this is all a story you've seen before, and again, we'll make sure you have these slides so you can look back at them. If you click one more time, because Caitlin, just a reminder, not all of us have seen it before. Mm -hmm. This is true. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So we will make sure that everybody has access to it. So we have, again, once we reconciled the grant to reflect what we've currently spent and what we are projected to spend on these positions, we've got about $269,000 left to spend in ESSER 2. And if you click one more time, that will be partially consumed by um, we have hiring a literacy interventionist for the high school for next school year and extending that third principal at MUMS for one more school year. So that will be covered in this remaining ESSER 2 money, um, and that won't eat all of that. So there's a little bit of money still on the table that we haven't planned for yet in ESSER 2. Any questions? Because that's basically the end of the review of this, and then we're, I think it is. Great. Go ahead. You've, actually, you've seen this before, and if you click one more time, this is how we were do, spending our ARP IDEA, and the plan is just to carry these investments forward. They don't expire this year, so we can keep doing this work. We haven't spent all of the money. Okay. 
paper? Yeah, for the um, other two that you presented where we still have money to spend, um, I believe you said allocate, which means they could be spent beyond the date or we have to spend it by that September date. Oh, Logan, tell me if I get this wrong. <laughs> basically, basically we need to have it spent by that September 30th. So I, I don't think that we, so what's really clear is we can't be employing people in that school year when it expires on September 30th. Right. But I think, in fact, like if we've got construction projects running, they need to be done by then. But there are there's some little bit of gray area. You, there's like 90 days to like liquidate something. Yeah, it's it, it's kind of a matter of committed. Like we haven't we know what the money's earmarked for and it's in progress, which is different than a teacher for a, a staff member who right. hasn't actually provided those services yet. That doesn't really count. Right. But if Even it's kind of committed, a contract. You yeah, know, that it, still doesn't. If it's kind of we, the rights to it is no longer ours. That kind of concept. Right. Yeah. So our besser is the big one. This is not. A, this is a review still too, right? The 3.3 million that we haven't allocated yet. Um, we have to spend at least 20% of it on addressing learning loss using evidence-based interventions. That's uh, defined in in the regulations. We this one's a little bit wonky. We need to we need to develop and make publicly available a plan for safe return to in-person instruction. We got this information last winter after we had published our plan for safe return in August before, right? And so we needed to repost it and open it for public comment to check this box, mm -hmm. which was it was just an awkward thing to have to do to be in compliance. But we did the thing. So this is done, and this you'll see reflected in our, um, in our grant planning. Mm -hmm. OK, so we have been engaged in extensive stakeholder engagement through all of our response to COVID. And some of it, when it informs our grants, can count toward ARP or stakeholder engagement, even if we did it before they rolled out the regulations. So some of this is from the past. ARP ESSER has extra and specific requirements about how we need to engage, not so much how, but that we need to engage stakeholders across a wide range of categories um, in meaningful ways. And so we've done our very best with that. And we've definitely, we, we've met the minimum bar. And I think in many places we've gone above and beyond. Challenging, our, um, challenging to engage our sort of civil rights groups, tribes. Um, there are really specific categories that we needed to make sure that we connected with. So we started um, grant planning with an initial needs assessment in the winter of 2021. <laughs> We did an employee survey, survey that spring, last spring. We did our board presentation about ESSER funds in December. Our recovery planning team, which has been meeting since June of 2020, I believe, um, has looked at ESSER funding at three different meetings and had conversations about that. We did, in that equity diagnostic survey, the Hanover survey that you weren't many of you weren't able to access, we added questions about ESSER funding because we were blasting that to so many people and rather than ask for their input on multiple <coughs> tools, we embedded it in there. So we got a lot, we got 800 something um, responses to that survey, which was great. Then, um, so from that we were really able to start to narrow down our focus. We did, this is that Tuesday conversation that um, Nicole was talking about. I presented our draft thinking of our ARP ESSER planning to ACSD educators last Tuesday, and we had a conversation about that. We, we published the same slideshow online and opened a Google form to collect feedback. So we had feedback in that conversation, but we also had um, 57 responses to that survey. So that's this online communication and feedback form. And then for um, some of those harder to capture voices, <coughs> underrepresented groups, Emily Blistein actually went and scheduled one-on-one -on -one and small group conversations and, and talked to them about this funding opportunity, what we're thinking about, and receiving feedback. And I'll take your question in one second. No worries. This plan, our plan is called the Public, public Plan for ARP ESSER Spending. We're required to have it posted online tomorrow and open for public comment. We're finishing it up tonight. It'll be online tomorrow. It'll be open for public comment for the month of April. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> right up to the wire. Well, giving it the old college push. Um, <laughs> so the online communication and feedback form, what was the target audience? That was the, kind of the other question, the previous question I asked. So we opened, we, we mostly were asking to, en to engage our, for this presentation and conversation, we were asking to have a conversation with ACSD employees, staff, faculty, mm -hmm. administrators, really just opening it up to say, hey, this is what we're thinking. Please, from your positions in our system, give us your feedback. But, but then we thought that there's no reason to not collect feedback from other people as well. And so Emily posted it online and you emailed it out? Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, two weeks. I think it was maybe a week and a half. Friday. On a Friday. Friday. Yeah. So it went out to the whole ACSD community, yeah. right? So it was a link to the actual slideshow, and then there was a Google form. I can't remember if the Google form was in the email or just posted was, on the yeah. web page. So, so that we showed them, you know, what are we thinking about spending, and you'll see the feedback. You'll see a, a real brief summary of the quantitative feedback from that survey. Um, and we have, I mean, 57 isn't a phenomenal turnout, but it was nice to get some other perspectives. I didn't get that. I don't know why. I don't either. We're not educators. No, but we but it went out beyond just educators. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if you didn't send it. Yeah, because I know Joanna had got it, and I went back and looked, and I was like, I didn't get that. Would I, would we be able to get it on the ACSD website or the yeah. webpage? I think it's still posted. The Google form is closed because we finished processing the feedback. Right. Um. All right. So we can problem solve that later. Okay. If you um. If you read the public plan, which will be posted tomorrow, you will see that it has a, a little bit of a narrative about each of these bullets explaining what we did to engage people and what we learned from that engagement. Okay. So, now we want to tell you what we want to do with this money. Um, broadly speaking, our investment strategies fall into three major categories. So, mental health slash social emotional learning slash positive behavior support. Access and success in academic learning, and healthy schools with a specific focus on indoor air quality. So those are our three broad categories for these grants. So we had a challenge, and this is the challenge basically that we presented to our colleagues last week. We had a wish list of $5 million, give or take, and $3.3 million to spend. So we so as I mentioned, we've done a lot of engagement recently to really try to help us narrow that list um, and understand what the community thinks will be the most positively impactful investments we can make. This is way more than you can read in tiny font in this format, so we'll make sure you've got it at your fingertips. There, we, we proposed, um, in our public in our public presentation seven different investments related to mental health sel positive behavior and you can see the blue bars are what people those 57 <coughs> respondents um, reported as the first priority of spending red is the second priority orange is the third and green is this is not a priority right so we had seven and we kind of wanted to force people to to trim where they needed to trim so that we could understand what makes the cut and what doesn't this is a, was highly popular. It's extending the FTE of school counselors. Uh, I think this is predominantly looking at our outlying schools who have a counselor for one or two days a week. And there's real interest in increasing the access to school counselors in those buildings. Um, this was social workers, prevention specialists in our elementary schools, um, these two. This is continuing the one at Shoreham, and this is adding another one to fill gaps of unmet needs in the district. This is continuing those behavior interventionist positions at Mums for one more school year. Um, an outdoor club at MUHS got a high bar for not a priority. So you'll see it didn't make our cut in our spending plan. And updating the security camera systems at Mums and the high school also didn't resonate with our stakeholder groups. Can I just ask, is this only the 57 that filled out? This does not reflect the conversations that you had? Right, so I think that that's a really important point. We've done all of this stakeholder engagement, and I'm showing you just one slice of one of those things that we did mm -hmm. to show you sort of the last, the last data that we really considered as we, and if you read that plan, it goes into much more detail about the various steps that brought us to this point. Okay. Question? Yeah. I'm looking at the uh, 
the fund for the outdoor club at MUHS. There, there's a great deal of uh, research that points to the fact that if, if you get kids outside, they're going to socially benefit, psychologically benefit. <coughs> so I wonder if this was couched in proper terms so that people really understood that situation. I doubt it. No, we didn't go deep in any okay. of these, but just for the capacity of, of moving the information out and getting the feedback back. Okay. I'm not sure that an outdoor club will have the same kind of impact that you're talking about as much as systematizing outdoor practice in our schools. So I think that just because it's not making the cut for our investor investments doesn't mean that it's not a thing that we care about and want to, to right, look into. Right, because an, out, an outdoor club could, can have many variations of itself. And it could certainly fit into what you just indicated. Middlebury College uses it pre their <coughs> freshmen coming in. Uh, it's well stated and well known. Yep. <coughs> You're right. Yes, I agree. All right, let's look at our next category. Oh, sorry. We did ask this question. You know, based on what we're proposing, and we gave them a sort of dollar amount for what it would cost to do all of those things, estimated. And we said, you know, blue is, this seems like about the right amount to spend on this category of mental health, SEL. Um, red was, you should spend more in this area. Orange was, you should spend less in this area. And green was, I don't know whether this is, feels right or not. Yeah, so, and again, this is the 50-some odd yep. respondents. So, do we know geographically where those respondents are? Because that could really... You? Oh, yes, Mary Hogan made a very strong representation. Okay, so that, yeah, so you have to kind of put that green. Yeah, yeah no, looking at the data. Right, you shouldn't, just like Nicole wasn't giving us any statistical analysis, we're just showing you raw numbers that we've collected right. and knowing that this is really just a slice right. of the way that we've processed this yes. information. And absolutely, there Thank are you. people who showed up because they cared very deeply about this thing, largely. Okay, next one. So there, this breaks down into two slides because we have a lot of things that we wanted to do in terms of access, success, and success in academic learning. So again, the pink is this is not a top priority. And then we let them rank up to their top six because there were two slides of this. There were 12 different ideas presented. So we were looking at extending our preschool coordinator for it's a half-time position for a third year to give us just another year to really build those systems. Extending our literacy coordinator for a third year. Continuing to fund um, foundational literacy materials, supplies, PD. Uh, funding a literacy interventionist at the high school for a second year. Remember, it, it showed up for a first year, next year in SR2. So this would be extending it for a second year. Hiring, we proposed hiring a math coordinator. The feedback that we got was very much, we don't want another coordinator, we need, want somebody working with students. Yes. And so you're going to see that this becomes <coughs> math interventionist at the high school in our proposed plan. Um, and investing in math, PD, collaboration, and resources. The next slide. More things. So hiring a 0.5 FTE multilingual community liaison to really help us to engage um, second language learners and families and do a lot of outreach to underrepresented members of our community. Hire a summer and after school programming coordinator. Hire a summer and after school educators. Continue to fund the general educator position at MOMS. Remember, in SR2, we brought in another general educator at MOMS. And the plan here is that we pay for it one more year in SR2, and then we, we basically bought ourselves a year to write that into the local budget. That gets us up to that four that four-team staffing model, we added two positions this year. We'll need to add one more next year to sustain those four teams. But for now, it's in ESSER. Continuing to fund the special educator at MOMS for a second year, next year, and adding a classroom teacher at Mary Hogan. So that's what we've got for that category. Go ahead, Will. And 38.6% said that looks about right. 29.8 uh, said that we're, we should increase spending. A uh, very small percentage said we should decrease it, and 26.3 said, I don't know. So that's where we were with that one. Okay. 
we had uh, big ideas for building projects. Um, we were actually proposing about $2 million of um, work on HVAC systems in Mary Hogan and the high school and replacing windows and doors at Cornwall, Mary Hogan, Salisbury, and the high school. So that's what we floated. Um, and you can see top priority, unsure, and not a priority for each of these. Go ahead, Will. Um, and you can see the same breakdown about, seems about right, we should increase our spending, we should decrease our spending, and I'm not sure. So we also collected um, open-ended responses. So there's a lot of information that people gave to us about their thinking around how we were doing. They agree, they disagree, joyfully, vehemently, we got it all. And um, so we've been thinking about that and reflecting. And then our, our leadership team met this morning to do sort of a final, okay, so what do we know from, from our stakeholder engagement? So Peter and Logan, Nicole and I, and Bruce, representing facilities and Emily who's been helping with our stakeholder engagement extensively we all met and tried to synthesize that and so what you'll see in these next slides and in the public facing plan that gets published in much more detail tomorrow here's what we propose and again this plan will be open for public comment for a month so in the category of mental health social emotional learning and positive behavior supports we want to spend about nine hundred eighty one thousand dollars um, Continuing that position, the social worker prevention specialist at Shoreham, and adding a position um, to serve unmet needs, the same kind of position to serve unmet needs in other places in the district for two years. So this is a third year at Shoreham and the next two years addressing needs based on data. Continuing our SEL coordinator for a third year, continuing our behavior interventionist for a second year, and retention bonuses for educators. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we propose in that category. Go ahead, Will. You like this is a big one. So under access and success in academic learning, we propose about $1.5 million, extending our preschool coordinator, our literacy coordinator, doing a second year of literacy interventionist at the high school, continuing to build our um, foundational literacy uh, materials, which is a lot of decodable texts, and, and um, really building those libraries to support early literacy development. Hiring a math interventionist at the high school for two years. Investing in math materials, PD, and collaboration. That second year of the general educator at MUMS and the special educator at MUMS. Um, that second year of the third principal at MUMS. Adding a general educator to Mary Hogan for two years in the first grade. Um, and investing in summer and after school programming, hiring a coordinator for two years, reserving funds to pay educators, and to consider challenges around transportation. We don't know what that model will be, but the idea would be to invest big in the short term to build a thing that we can sustain over time. It's a bit of a leap, but it's an identified need. And then finally, the multilingual community liaison, 0.5 FTE for two years. I, I may be missing something, but if, if you're going to be asking for public comment mm -hmm. on the use of these funds, are you somehow going to indicate that 57 people, individuals, are like, the basis of it? Well, you'll see um, there is more than a page of explanation of how we engage stakeholders, okay. and these 57 are sort of the last thing that we did as we had really narrowed down our focus it will just be one piece of that narrative okay. yep all right next slide we propose that we spend eight hundred eighty thousand dollars on did somebody have a actually right, finish this slide great question on our indoor air quality that would mean replacing the hvac systems in the a wing and c wing of mary hogan and doing some of the engineering work to set ourselves up for the replacement in um, the high school H wing, this won't get this won't get this project done, but it will get it underway. It'll get it s sort of poised to be funded in another way. Yeah. No, I'm just curious. You know, if we've gone after any of the original, I think it was CRF money that went through Efficiency Vermont for ventilation work, we air quality work, I should call it. We did, and we are. I'm actually working on a form right now for waiver agent 
boardwalk. So that's not included in this? Not included in this, okay. yeah. No, and you will see, Logan raised his hand, you will see in our public plan that um, we also outline that this plan is about our Besser, but these other six grants are related to our COVID recovery. Does it address what Peter was just asking in that well, table? I, I don't know if this will address it, but uh, there's another round of $15 million of the CRF, or I think it's CRF, Efficiency Vermont Indoor Air Quality money that's newly available and COVID HVAC, uh, COVID HVAC, Cornwall HVAC overhaul and Weybridge, I think it's HVAC work we're pursuing with that money. And then um, the uh, leap into uh, after school programming, some of the original federal money was, it almost was required that there be after school programming. And uh, I'm just curious to know if that was able to be spent. I know there was a terrible problem with finding anybody who was, was willing to it take almost on the work. Destroyed yeah. us. Yeah. We, uh, <laughs> not to be too dramatic, though. We needed to pull off summer programming using those funds in very short order without staff to lead it. And um, I, Nicole and I lost many hours of sleep trying to pull that off at the start of this past summer. We ended up, we, I think our original investment I would need to look back to be really clear. I think it was around $195,000. We ended up spending less than $50,000. For it be for lack of, of staff. We, could couldn't find, we couldn't find people to do the work. Yeah. People were exhausted. Yeah. So, you know, we're proposing that we need a coordinator, somebody to spearhead it and really lead the work, but then also to pay for educators to do the work if they're willing to do it. Mm -hmm. So you can see we've got a lot of positions that we're trying to hire. We've been trying to hire positions all year. So we, again, we can amend this grant. You know, as we post positions and they don't fill, we can amend them out of the grant up to near the end of the whole spending period. When we amend them, I, I believe we need to also amend the actual public plan. So we'd like to get it close to right to start because that's easier for us. And also, when it just doesn't pan out the way that we expect it to, it's, it's really a pretty dynamic um, grant model. Part of this is there's going to be a lot of competition because there are school districts that got significantly more money than this. Right. Yeah, right. Yep. Right. Yep. And we and we might attract people from our own system, which will then create new holes for us. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for the uh, indoor quality. Yep. yep. How did we determine? And also, even for the grants you're currently working on with Efficiency Vermont, how did we decide? what schools that we would go after. Bruce has done a lot of study of all of our HVAC systems, so he knows, he's kind of queued up which ones are have the most need. Okay. And there was a lot of measurement that happened during this COVID period to know more than we ever thought we should know about our HVAC systems. Okay, so it was based on assessment of yeah. what needs it the most. There's been a lot, yeah, there's been a lot of measurement um, to make sure that rooms that were kind of quote unquote up to code and that's where I, I think at the start of COVID we started to understand more about our HVAC systems than we had previously and as they, they came into such focus too yeah. after would, the first few months. Would we consider posting that on the website so that if someone's looking at this they would basically say oh okay that makes sense. Um, just kind of disclosing well this is what we are our, our, Kind of an analysis yeah, of why. Our most need, yeah. you know, as far as. Does you know, Jerry just, have something? Do you know if he has anything like that? I don't know. Okay. It, yeah, because it would just <coughs> help people to say, oh, yeah, that makes sense based on that. Yeah. Otherwise, it's kind of a natural question. Yeah. Yeah. Why not my school or okay. whatever? Right. I think a lot of the parts and stuff, the, you know, the hardware that yeah. does a lot of this stuff is that end of life. Yeah. So that's what I've heard them talk about. Sure. That's all we go with. Which could be true at other places too. So having that assessment somewhere, I think would help people. I think that's it. Yeah, Joanna. I was trying to reconcile that last slide that just disappeared with an earlier bar graph that said sort of the HVAC system was very high blue bar, not a priority. And so, is there anything that wasn't funded that you got that you asked for feedback on? It seems like. In your proposal that we're looking or you're looking to get public comment on, was everything included just funded at different levels? Would you go back to the um, few slides back? No, forward, 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 forward. 
<laughs> no, this you're going. I think we're going in the wrong I direction. Think, I think it was the it's, one that with the two big bar graphs, and I think the blue was top priority actually. This is this is like I'm gonna just take over. <laughs> ah, this is it. Yeah. Right. So blue is a top priority on this one. The cut. This is these graphs are generated by Google Forms, and they arbitrarily change the colors. So be not confused by the colors. In this one, blue is the top priority. Red is unsure, and yellow, orange is not a priority. So you were never you were never asking, it, you know, invest in infrastructure versus invest in staff. That was never something that you were asking. For. We got that information in open-ended responses, uh, opinions about that. But no, we said, look, we want to fund investments across three categories. We can't do all of the things. In this category of mental health and yes. social, okay. social, how would you rank these? Okay. In this category of academic learning, how would you rank these? So we didn't actually ask them to compare. If just, I, just came, I, just, I think, sorry, I think yeah. it, it did come through, and it's what we talked about this morning. When we initially started this process, we went right, we saw this monstrous, you know, $3 million, and we thought, okay, we have so many facilities needs that we never get to. Yeah. This would be great to use part of this because it's so hard for us to build that into the budget. Mm -hmm. So that was our initial thinking, and as we have talked to more and more people and gathered information, again, beyond this 57, right, this 57 is one slice of, of this whole process, we realized that the, you know, kind of predominant wisdom from our community is let's, let's focus on positions and people. In addition, what we talked about this morning and what has been talked about here is also the fact that we are right on the, the end of the analysis of elementary and secondary schools facilities, facility analysis that Turex Collins is just finishing up like this month. So we'll be talking, I think, and we'll be bringing a recommendation here to look at bonding at some point, um, whether that's next March or another time, to deal with all of these delayed maintenance issues across our district that are, are that we have to take care of, and we're not going to ever be able to build these into a budget. So that was another consideration, too. Are we going to be able to fill all these positions that we're putting forward? I'd be really surprised, and I, I, I think it, it's, that is going to be the biggest challenge, is finding people. Right. But Joanna, to your point, we had a pretty large proportion of people say we're spending too much on our healthy uh, schools, on our construction projects. We had put forward $2 million worth of investments and we dialed it back down to 880,000. Great. So trying to be responsive to that feedback and address the most critical needs quickly. I think the other thing that we have talked about over really over the last probably year and a half with these federal funds is, is thinking about the right positions and not wanting to, being really cognizant of that cliff that I mentioned before, that 24, we're gonna have none of these positions and we're going to be back to or into a new a new hopefully a new paradigm as we kind of like learn from this time period and think about our current staffing structures and I, I think at, you know at, at budget time next year and definitely the year after we'll be having some pretty hard conversations around which positions are really critical which positions aren't and I would imagine that we're going to find that some positions that we put in place we're not going to want to let go of, and we're going to have to either look at other positions that we have that we need to think about differently, or you know, take it into the budget. And we can only, you know, we've got some other pressures happening too with the, all the other stuff we talked about endlessly. One more question. <laughs> and you won't be surprised I'm going to ask this question. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh, here she goes again. Um, I, I always kind of look at, from a fiscal responsibility perspective, regardless of if it's this money or taxpayer money or whatever, how do we know what that, the monies and the, you know, what we've spent has been effective, right? Um, because that's like the million dollar question that people ask and there's nothing I know of that I can point to yeah. that shows that assessment and says, yep, you know, you know, maybe we didn't quite get 
the hope that we, you know, honestly wanted to get, but we got improvement here. Right. And well, I think if you look at, you know, if you look at adding you know, these positions, for example, over a two-year period, the ability to assess that position's impact on a student's test scores, right. if that's what you're looking at, or and all whatever. the mediating factors that would be involved if you were looking at that student's day over 24 hours, and especially over two years of adding the position, it would be hard to, I think, statistically say, we added this position, that was responsible for this student's 13% growth in reading and 18%. Right. I, I think we could, if we're doing the work in the right way, and we're in the classroom, or working with these people, and we're really dialed into the assessments that are happening, we can take things away from that to then decide again in two years, are these positions that we added having an impact both on a quantitative standpoint and again we're gonna surmise, right? We're gonna yeah. we're gonna have to there, there's a qualitative aspect to right. it as well. Um, and which is why, you know, Nicole shared that information yeah. first tonight to, to create a bit of a backdrop for our thinking around mm -hmm. how we're investing these funds and where they need to go. There is other work as we look at these positions, we still have to determine in terms of our team structure at each school and what the counseling support looks like. You know, we have, if you look at our models across our elementary schools, for example, they're not all the same in terms of one school has a clinician, one school doesn't. One school has a social worker, one school doesn't. They aren't all the same, and I don't think we're we're going to have one kind of like staffing model that's exactly the same every school because the needs are different. Exactly. There's historical context too, but we we do want to make sure that we're funding with equity and we're putting <coughs> positions in places that, that those schools really need them and they're making an impact. And that that's a hard thing for our community sometimes when. That school doesn't get it. This school does because there's more need at this school. Right. Well, and that is the equity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, you're yeah. giving them a higher ladder, basically, to, yeah. Yeah. you know, pick the apple or whatever that right. thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm watching the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it may All right. Be, last uh, question, and then we're going to move yeah, on. It's, it's not so much a question, but it, it may be more difficult to, to say in a period of two years, X percentage of a goal has been achieved, but if that goal had been broken down into 20 objectives, you could certainly have pointed to six or seven, perhaps. Oh yeah, this student has met those <coughs> objectives. We're 30 percent of the way there. You know that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I just wanted to ask a question about the public process. Um, you are not having any public <coughs> meetings about this it's just online and people will fill in their feedback we don't have any public meetings planned at this point okay um is that something thank we you, want to do? caitlin and nicole it is always such a pleasure to hear from both of you and um to get a little glimpse into the upstream work that you're doing so thank Thanks. you for being here um, when you have a deadline hanging over your head. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, are you? Um, all right, on to the report of the board. Um, you all received your committee assignments. Um, as I stated in the, my email to you all. Yes. Before you get into that, we do have um, in the agenda, the little thing about the news, um, the I mean, board kind of the newsletter. I know. Are you I'm leading into that? I'm leading into that. Okay. Just want to make sure you didn't <laughs> yep. see it. Oh, no, I see it. I got okay, it. Thank cool. you. Sorry um, <laughs> Anyway, so, so committee assignments have gone out. Um, it was sort of a brain game of making sure that we had a mix of old and new and small town in Middlebury and um, and what people were interested in. Um, so sort of the next thing is maybe uh, once this meeting is adjourned, if you get together with your group and find, decide when you're gonna have your first meeting, um, and that is when you will um, elect a chair for your committee. 
Um, in addition, there's a doodle poll that either went out this afternoon or will go out tomorrow um, to get some ideas for dates for our retreat um, and, and uh, board training. Next is Mary Heather maybe wants to touch a little bit on the draft school board news. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just want to make sure, um, and this doesn't need to take up a lot of time, I just want to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to put their eyes on the draft um, board update that we want to put out. The Communications and Engagement Committee has recommended uh, trying to adhere to a quarterly schedule of just regular um, sort of proactive uh, communications to um, you know, keep folks surprised as to what committees are working on, when meetings, important dates, and things are coming up. So we have slated um, uh, a, a board update to go out the end of March, beginning of April. They should kind of stay on a, a quarterly schedule. Our last one went out at the end of the year in December. Um, this one, uh, as you can see, just um, welcomes uh, new board members, uh, gives um, or expresses gratitude for our outgoing board members um, and our uh, COVID coordinator Kelly, Nurse Kelly at the high school, um, and then gives just kind of bulleted highlights from committee work. So um, this is the draft that our committee has put together. Just wanted to make sure you all were able to put your eyes on it. Um, any concerns or questions, please email me. Um, but that's pretty much it. Um, and then we would hope to get this out. When, you, when would you like feedback by? Um, I would say probably the end of the week or Monday would be great so that I can try to get this out uh, like yes. early, um, <laughs> early April. And that actually triggered quite, uh, there have been some questions um, because we as a board have received um, public comment that's gone to the whole board and so I know there's questions especially from the new members is how what what the procedure is for responding to public comment um, as you've seen in the recent ones I've responded and then let you all know just so that if, I, I know that feeling of like is someone going to respond yeah. I want to make right. sure that this person knows that they're being um, they're, email has landed safely. Um, so we actually, the, the communications committee last year, um, Mary Heather, do you want to talk about what the sort of the policy procedure? Yeah, so um, we had kind of drafted just a, a procedure for responding, having the board respond to incoming emails like that. And in general, um, either the board chair or a designee of the board chair um, I did it a couple of times last year, um, just would respond with just kind of a form, um, thank you for your comment, it's landed safely, um, and, um, and we'll be discussing it, or um, making sure that if it pertained to a particular um, issue that it went to the correct committee chair, or if it um, needed to go to the superintendent, for example. Basically, the policy is to make sure that you follow the chain of command if it needs to go um, to uh, central office administrators, um, and then uh, direct it to the appropriate committee chair. Um, and then uh, what I tried to do was copy everyone so that everyone on the board knows that the email has been responded to. Yeah. That's, that's the process that we've put out. Right. And I think in general, if you then if you get an email to you as an individual as a board member, you're welcome to respond. You just need to make sure that it's clear that you're not speaking on behalf of the board, that you're just speaking for yourself. Um, that's it. Can I just ask one question yes. on, on that as far as communication? Because there was a question on the website relative to whether our private our private phone numbers would be on there. I don't know if we ever made a decision mm -hmm. on that. Yeah, yeah they, they have. They, um, um, that yeah. actually has been resolved. So um, board member private phone numbers are not on the um, website. Our ACSD emails are. Right. And we do have posted a board, a dedicated board voicemail number that folks um, can call and leave a voicemail. Um, the communications and engagement committee checks that it's at least weekly, and our the outgoing message says that. So okay, when so folks call in, they know. That my question was: if someone has a question of one board member in a 
way that they just don't want to put it onto the email. There's a way that they can address that through that voicemail that you, if you pick it up, then you say, this person was calling you particularly. Yep. Okay. Yep, yep. Because, I mean, everybody knew my phone number 15 years ago, okay, so that they always could call. Hardly anybody did, but I never felt burdened by having my phone number on. And honestly, I was sort of not, I guess, in that loop saying that they should be there or not. But uh, I don't want to be protected from the public by having that type of thing. I, I just find that that's, uh, it, it never was. It was never a huge burden. It was never a huge burden. And, uh, you know, I think, I don't know. Uh, as long as that voicemail thing can work, I just feel that when we're sort of set, you know, we don't have phone books anymore, and we're, many of us use our cell phones, so I mean, it, for me to figure out how to even call some of you guys, I don't have that information necessarily, uh, and I, I, I just want to make sure that we're doing it right and not being so protected or isolated that we don't. Yeah. Maybe others don't feel that yeah. way, but that's the way. No, I mean, I've never minded my phone number out there. I mean, I mean yeah, I get 10 calls a day telling me my student debt, which I never had, <laughs> is not good enough. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. like, in this day and age, I think people want to track you down, they can track you down. And there are still phone books out there. Some of us are yeah, actually still saying, I mean, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not saying that there aren't. I'm just. It's harder. To yeah, find I just want to make sure that yeah. we're not making. Yeah, um, also, before we move on to the policy committee update, um, another communications issue or uh, thing to remember is that when you are communicating board member to board member or to superintendent or whatever, you should use your ACSD email. Um, because if there's a public record request or what have you, it's just much easier to have that filtered rather than have to go into your private email. Um, so if everybody can remember to do that. I think it's actually recommended by the VSBA mm -hmm. that um, any board work be done through your board email address and should never be done through your whole email address. Right. Um, <coughs> all right, I'm gonna hand it over to Mary okay. for policy revision discussion. Um, so, we have banked a bunch of policies that we've been looking at. Um, this year we noticed that, well actually for probably the last year and a half we've noticed that many of the policies that we were originated when ACSD came together as a, a board um, were adopted in 2016, in 2017, and 2018. And ideally, um, we should go through our policies and review them and update them every three years. So we're in the process of doing that now. Um, so you've got a whole bunch right now, and these are the ones we've been working on for the last couple months. Um, so I'm going to go through them and let you know where uh, the changes are, because most of them are very similar to the original uh, policy. The first policy groups are the A group, and those are our board policies, our board, how we operate as a board. Um, VSB, or VSBA, um, the Vermont State School Board, only has one policy for board operations, and it's uh, um, conflict of interest. So when our board first came together in 2016, uh, we, we had, I think we have maybe, I'm not sure how many, but there's like eight different policies for the policy for the ACSC board. So we've gone through the first two for this uh, review and then we picked off a bunch of the policies that are required in the B category which is uh, for um, employees. So we, that's why there's a couple of in the B category. And then we have a couple in the D category which is for students. So I'm going to start with A and I'm going to ask um, Suzanne if can you take notes as people make comments on, on if they sure. if they want to add anything or they have a question about that? Um, so the first one is A1, which is govern governments or governance governance commitment, and it's basically sort of saying why this school board 
this is sort of the, our vision and our mission of what we're doing as a school board. Uh, when you read through this, most of this is the same uh, policy that was adopted in 2016. The only thing that we have added or changed is um, we added a piece about we feel that we need an annual review of this policy so that we can sort of decide, did we, did we meet the commitment that we made in this policy, review what we've done, you know, have we done a good job, have we executed all the uh, pieces in this policy. So that's the first thing. Um, but in making that recommendation, we feel like there needs to be some kind of a process or a procedure that outlines how we will do that. So whether it's done in a board retreat or um, we do a survey or we have, you know, some kind of a possibility of doing feedback. So that's that's a recommendation we're doing for this one, that we need a procedure or policy to do an annual review. The second piece that we um, talked about was um, strategic plan. The first five years that we've been together since 2016, the strategic plan has been what we've worked on for the last couple of years, and now that we're moving into a different strategic plan, which is equity, we know that at the end of this year, we're probably going to have to make some adjustments to this policy again to represent that. Okay, And one of the pieces on the um, strategic plan was that we communicate with our constituents and you know have a good line of communication. And Mary Heather's group who has been doing the planning and engagement came up with this draft back in November and uh, Mary Heather just talked about some of the things that she's already done to do some of that communication and we think that a procedure or process like you have sort of outlined here kind of meets, meets that um, recommendation. So um, again that's another piece that we feel we need to work on to actually complete this policy. But the actual written policy, we feel like the draft that you got, that you received, um, basically states this and it's just making sure that we have the procedures in place for our review, our annual review, and then um, communication with our constituents. So, I'd like you to take a look at this over the, you know, and if any feedback you want to send to us, we really appreciate it. If anybody has any comments of anything they've read so far. Yes, yes, great. Just, um, and this will, it's just to make sure we don't lose it. Yep. There were hypertext links in the original policy document that um, aren't defined in the new one. Um, um, like the only way to get the to the ACSD charter is through this link mm -hmm. that was on there, mm -hmm. and it's just making sure that those links are added back in. Right. Right. Um, okay. Because I, in the past, tried to find the charter, and I was able to get to it from this document, but it's not something you can find on our website. Right. So it's important, and it also then had a link to the ACSD strategic plan. Great. Okay. okay. I just tried that hyperlink, and it doesn't. Work. Yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't work. I accessed it. Oh, to the charter. It worked the other day when yeah. I tried it. Yeah. 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 Weird. Well, um. That is something we, when we were looking at all our policies, we wanted that hyperlink so that. And maybe that connect. charter document, we need to find a real home for it, so it's right. hanging off somewhere because it's kind of an important document. Okay. I mean. um, the other thing I noticed, you know, what I ended up doing is I compared to the old and the yep. new uh -huh. electronically. Uh -huh. um, so we took out, um, and I know the name of the committee is now right, so we changed right, that. but right. it was in a. A way of, of, you know, it's basically talking about reaching out to the community in a variety of ways to make sure that we're really getting to representative um, input. Uh -huh. um, that was taken out of the current policy. And I know in the past I had talked about kind of like community engagement and vision. Uh, there's A23, and a lot of right. it is in here. Right. Uh -huh. Right. And I think if you 
look at 823, there's maybe more of it that could just be put in this policy. Um, Combine the two? Yeah, because you already have a couple of the paragraphs already. Mm -hmm. Like that last paragraph is directly from 823. In your policy, an A1, it's directly right. there. Right. Um, okay. And if you look at the rest of the text that's in A23, I think it does it a little, you know, maybe a little more clearly, um, that community <coughs> engagement piece of it. It's just a, rec you know, a thought. It's something to think about. Okay. Where um, A23, are you finding that on the ACS? Yeah. 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 You know what? I can just give you this. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. And you'll see, I you know, I have little marks where it says, okay, this one is already no, that's there. Great. I yeah, I appreciate so, your notes. Yeah. Okay. And thank you. Okay. So, ideally, we'll vote on these at some later date. Okay. Okay. So the second policy is A two key responsibilities for board members. Um, we basically kept the same policy that's here, but we added, uh, and it's, I have to say it's towards the end of the first page, uh, in order to prepare new board members to the roles and responsibility of the board, the board chair and superintendent will develop a board orientation uh, to be, procedure along with meeting with new members, orientating them to the district policies, et cetera, that whole paragraph. That's that's all new. It, it's basically to make sure that we um, provide an orientation program to all new board members. And then we changed the uh, name of the Communication and Engagement Committee. And on the very bottom, you probably can't see it since it's in such small uh, letters, the board should determine a process for reviewing and monitoring those roles and responsibilities. Um, again, it's a way of us to evaluate how we're doing. Do we need to uh, change anything? So another way for us to just evaluate ourselves as a, as a board. So, okay. So I have a, just a couple little yep. things. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, in that new section um, where it starts, in addition, new board members are encouraged to attend a Vermont right. State School Board uh, a Seminar. Right. Isn't that a Vermont School Board Association seminar? You're talking about. Um, oh, all right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I would uh, get rid of state and right. you know do Thank Vermont you. School Board Association. Right. Okay. And then it makes it a little more clear where it is. Okay. Thank you. And the other thing I noticed was that this policy now is identifying that the executive committee would do the would nominate and or assign members to the standing committee so that's kind of a change that's right above oh board members serve by committees right yeah and then this identifies that now going forward that it would be a, the role of the executive committee uh -huh. as opposed to just the board chair uh-huh can I make a suggestion? I, um, I guess I feel like um, just in the interest of time and efficiency, if we can go through some of these fine, if there's a way for for the policy committee to receive fine tuning comments. That would be great. Um, yeah. In, in and actually, that's all I have. Okay. <laughs> yeah. sure that, that would be helpful. The other ones are yeah. pretty. They yeah. were. They're boilerplate. They're boilerplate. Yeah. yeah the these ones, are the ones that. Yeah. We, yeah. The other ones, they were like. Making them look like right. Vermont School Board Association. So no, no. It was I like, appreciate that. Put yeah. there another thing. Oh, so yeah. So going for if oh. if you have sort of the you know um, word choice or whatever comments, um, if you could email them to. I could me. I could put them on um, Google Doc with a opportunity for you to send feedback. Or is that a bad oh, idea? Yes. No, I should no, 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 it. Yeah. yeah. I'll do that. Okay. No, it violates the core. It right. gets all that stuff. Yeah. Okay, forget that. That's why I have so much trouble. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. So if you're done with that one, I'm moving we'll those two, and now we're going to go to the rest of them, which are like Peter said, they're boilerplate. Yep. Um, so B1 substitute teachers, B2 uh, volunteer work study. Uh, these are right off the SBAs. Um, um, website, model policy website, and 
we took them as they did it because they're state statutes. The only thing that's added on B1 is the uh, legal citations. So we just added those. Um, and we do have the process from the, um, from Gail Leach, who does um, employ, you know, the, she makes sure she, when she hires that she's following this process. Uh, the other, same with the volunteers and work study students. Only added a legal reference and then we're, we're hyperlinked to the process, okay? Um, then we have B3, which is alcohol and drug free workplace. Again, this is a required policy from BSBA. We didn't change anything. This is their updated version from 3, 3 2020. Uh, drug and alcohol testing, transportation. Again, this is uh, the SBA's uh, model. Can, can you make input at this at this time if we see something in one of these policies? Yeah, right? please send that to me. Yeah. Oh, send it to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, tobacco prohibition. These are all employee um, policies. Again, this is the required policy. Updated in 2019 from VSBA. They added again the legal citation. Okay, and the last one is um, D3, which is responsible computer, internet, and network use. Again, this is a required policy from VSBA. This is their boilerplate. Um, I asked Will to look at it. He says, yep, this looks pretty good. And um, so we're recommending. This was uh, updated in 2019 by ESBA. So we just want to re make sure that we're up to date on our policies and that we have them on the books as being. Jen. Yep. Jen. Yep. Yep. Um, so did you tailor any of these at all to comply with ACSD's policy? I'm, I'm looking specifically at the substitute teacher one where I know we do a background check, for yes. example. Yes. But it's not listed on here. Is that just something that's like a procedure within our district? And so we don't necessarily need yeah. to have it as a policy no, because yes. this is just the policy from the state. I'm just trying to figure out like what level we're supposed to be looking it, at. It, there is an, it's basically the same policy that's on our books right now. Right. Yeah. And With I'm some just changes. wondering what we what we need to have, right? So do we right. need to include something like we do a background check, pending a background check of all? Like you say they have to have a, a bachelor's degree, but right. we don't say that they can't be, you know, convicted of a crime. Right. No, no, no. Um, Any personnel who's hired has to go through that. A that's background part of the check. procedure. Yeah, it's part of the procedure. But that's a good question. Where yeah. does where does where does policy end and procedure begin in a case like this? Right, right. Because for school visitors, we actually do have that in there. So I'm just trying to figure yeah, out like yeah. what it's we're supposed to be there? looking at here and yeah. what we should keep an eye out for, right? Like, yeah. if mm -hmm. this is just what the state says and we're fine with that, and the school district has our own procedures, mm -hmm. is that covered someplace else, or should we be looking for things like that? I guess is my question. I recommend that we don't add to the required policy mm -hmm. policies okay. because we start to pick and choose, and then the next time things get lost, it's much better for us to yeah. to have those things ACSD specific Great. and keep keep these as they are. You know, historically we have sometimes gone into required policies and altered and changed things because we felt really strongly about something. It then requires the next four and three years and five years to remember that. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And things have gotten lost in right. translation year to year. So <clears throat> I, I feel more comfortable when we follow the VSBA required policies and th they look through this to make sure that everything that needs to be in here, and again, a lot of these arise out of statutory changes right. that require districts to do certain things. That's what promulgates the, the origination of a lot of these policies. So, you know, over the last couple of years, we've added special ed, the special ed policy, um, a number of other right. kind of things that weren't who we didn't have before because of was uh, a law change. Okay. So, Jen, I'm looking at page two of the substitute teachers, and it's the legal citations there that actually state the criminal background checks, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, um, prevention, identification, and uh, reporting of. So, you're saying it's referring to other. Yeah. It's referring to it's, other policies. It's referring. Yeah. Laws, it's, it's the laws. The, the law. Right. The statute. The statute. Steve, yeah, um, I, 
So these required and recommended policies from the DSBA. Yes. Part of I'm just clarifying here because I, I think people don't what know. What are we this. trying to do? Um, the <laughs> DSBA, their job or what we pay them to do is mm -hmm. to monitor legislation. Right. And they say this legislation is going to require policy changes, and we rely on them yep. to do that work for us. We change those required policies at our peril because the VSBA has, has, you know, they've got the lawyers hired to right. review this stuff, and, and they're doing that work for us. So I think, you know, that's it's important that we that we look at the policies, but that we understand that if we're going to change them, we may be messing with things that we don't understand yeah. because True. the VSBA is looking at the, the statutory um, right. you know, ramifications of, of putting these policies out. Thank you. Yeah. So That's, okay. that's good clarity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the process... Just one other thing to add um, that I'm connected to, to through my VSA presidency role now is um, VSA and VSBA are working together and got an equity grant from the state. And one thing that is happening right now is a review of all of the policies, all of the, the required and recommended policies on VSBA with an equity lens. So mm -hmm. I would expect that we're going to see a, a, a significant trove of new required policies coming that just the language might look a little different. It's still going to apply to the same statute that, that each one applies to. but. Um, they're, they're looking at it just through through that kind of equity lens. So okay. expect that probably in the next, I don't know, three or four months. <laughs> we have to do it Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So the process is going back in <laughs> policies too, so. What's that? Some policies that we were looking at, they pulled them back already. Right, they yeah. did, yeah. And so, so yeah, I, I you know, put uh, on the notes for uh, myself, which I'll give to Sharon, I put the date that the SBA reviewed it so that we know it's within many have been have been done between 2019 and, and now so but it sounds like there'll be even more changes yeah I think so. yeah okay. so we're going to continually have these over the next several months in big chunks right. to review and as as mary stated a lot of them are just <coughs> coming from us from the bsba um, and so what's the, the process? We review them tonight and then there'll be more for the next meeting um, and we'll take action on them. Right. But do send me your uh, feedback so I can explain if there's anything that needs explanation. Pardon me? When do you want that by? We need it tomorrow <laughs> night. We need it. It depends, it depends on when we're, we're war you have to warn them 10 days ahead. So. Yeah. So, yeah. I would say within it's not a, a lot week. Of time if yeah. it's going to be for the next board meeting. Yeah. But so if it's for the one we may do it the later in April. That's probably April. smarter. Yeah. Well, Mary, we were meeting in, May, in April. I know. Tomorrow so May, now that we have new people on our committee, we may have to change our date. Our like meeting like date. Wednesday. Wednesday. I have a meeting Wednesday, but okay. we can talk about that. One point about in all of these things, there's this constant review that we have to do it every year and whatever. I, as long as I've been on the boards, we've never kept up with that okay. because it is onerous. Honestly, it is. there's so many other things that one has to that, yeah. that has to happen. So, you know, I want to make sure that we don't put on all these things because it's just the right thing to do. Knowing full well we'll never be able to do do it completely. It's better not to have the rule if you're not going to follow it. Well, it's not my rule. I don't know where the rule came from. <laughs> no, I, I, I know that. But all of these say review by whatever. Yeah. And I don't know whether, you know, the policy Catch committee it. has a book which, you know, every month flashes what's going to happen. No. no, of course not. <laughs> but, but yet that's, but, but I just, you know, it's very easy to say, yeah, we'll review this in a year. Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah. It never happens. No. So well, we, we picked the first one, our governance <coughs> commitment, I, I, I as a place to I'm review what we're doing. making a general comment, yeah. so as yeah. we and go that's through this process, from hopefully organize. They don't have that. Yeah. So that was actually a good idea. Yeah. Okay. All right, moving on from policy. Okay. Is there any other? <coughs> Steve. I spent the entire day at the middle school today, um, and there was a parent group that provided um, a breakfast, I believe Jen was part of that. It was spectacular. Mm -hmm. I know that the staff that I spoke to, because um, I spent a lot of time in that room, um, were all highly appreciative of that, um, and were and felt very much 
um, that, there was so much food there that I, I, I saw it at 11 o'clock and said, this is what's left at 11 o'clock. <laughs> the teachers had already had breakfast off of it. So it was really impressive and it was really impactful. Um, so I'd like to recognize that group um, for the contribution that they made to make those middle school teachers feel appreciated. So, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, we'll kind of actually contributed something. <laughs> so there have been I um, attended the um, MB uh, Middlebury Community TV, oh, and I um, learned an interesting um, piece of data. Of all the YouTubes that they produce, mm -hmm. right, the most views, 30% of the total views are around our meetings mm -hmm. for ACSD. So people... Live or after the fact? After the fact, okay. right. It's going in and <coughs> clicking and actually reviewing wow. it, which I thought was impressive, so I thought I would yeah. share that, that, you know, they, people may not be able to you know, participate <laughs> live, but the information being out there is, in fact, viewed. Yeah, that's right. It's wonderful. All right, with that, any other questions? We're going to um, move into executive session for personnel reasons. Mm -hmm. for so I'll move that we so go into executive session just to discuss a personnel matter. Thank you very much. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I must raise my hand. That's a two-year habit. I'm going to have to break this. I know it's hard to do that. <laughs>